Hey guys, I'm Frank Cox. I'm the Barbecue Pit Engineer, and this is the Smoker Builder Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy this episode. Greg Rose has got a good one here. Is bracing on cook chamber doors really necessary on a 250-gallon propane build? I know a lot of them, a lot of reputable builders like Moberg don't use them. That's a great question, and it's something we probably should cover here. Um, By the way, if you don't know already, if you go to the menu, whether it's on the left-hand side of your desktop or if it's on, uh, if you're on your phone, it'll be up in the hamburger menu. It's like the three stacked patties is what I call it, hamburger. Um, There is a barbecue, uh, barbecue pit engineering with Frank course where I talk a lot about fabrication in there. But you can also go to, I think it's like $4.99 a month after a 30-day free trial, whatever. It's just to kind of keep this bill paid is all that's for. Um, But anyway, if you go over to the YouTube channel, I do have a series of videos about this topic. Um, But just to go ahead and answer Greg's question here. So the I don't brace anything if I don't have to. I'll just say it that way. Um, A lot of times what happens, the tank is what's moving. Like if you're working on a propane tank, you've got those heads that are welded onto the tank. Plus, those guys are just trying, when they roll the vessel, they're just trying to make the two ends come as close together as possible. They're not worried about that vessel being slightly egg-shaped or perfectly round or over-rolled a little bit too tight, and then they open it up and make it meet. As a matter of fact, if you look at the seam weld on the tank where the where the edges come together, uh, wherever it is, usually like it's at seven o'clock or or some or five o'clock or something on the tank, you'll see that there's flats where that tank comes together usually, or it could even be dipped in a little bit where that seam weld is that goes a long ways on the tank. That's a good indicator of what you're getting into when you look at that. But they force that tank it to fit the heads because the heads have like this swedge thing that's rolled on the inside of that, or they use a piece of strap. And they cram that head, the little lip inside the vessel, the the tank part, and that kind of brings it into submission. And then they use wedges and dogs and whatever else they got to do, depending on what the tank is. And then they use a process called submersible arc welding, which is uh, sub arc is the way to search that. If you want to see what that looks like on the YouTube, uh, look it up. I've seen it in person. It is awesome to watch. Um, But anyway, That being said, it's depositing three fillers at one time uh, underneath of a of a pile of flux core down inside that joint. And it's a one pass operation and it leaves a big bead on top. She's about a half inch wide on the bead or so. And what happens is that process is putting so much heat into that head and that tank that things move. And so basically what I'm saying by saying all of that about how they build the tank, we don't know what it's going to do when we cut. We can't predict it. We can't plan for it. However, uh, with with some guys, <laughs> oh my Garza, <laughs> I'll come to that in a minute. Anyway, um, so what happens is that tank is like moving all around and stuff is going crazy and we can't predict it. So we try to outsmart it before we cut the doors with gussets. That's a 50, 50 chance that it's going to work. So whenever I'm doing a, uh, whenever I'm building a cooker, if you watch the most recent uh, thousand gallon build uh, footage, that's from the summer, I think is when I published most of those videos you'll see that what I do first is I get the firebox hole cut and I get the firebox mounted. And what the strategic direction of that is if I cut a hole, I want to re I want to get, I want to get something in there to hold its shape as it is before I start cutting everything else. And I'll tack it, stitch it, weld it on, whatever. It doesn't matter. Then I'll go to the other head and I'll cut my collector box in, or if you're going to use an elbow, do that, whatever you're going to do on the other end, get that hole cut next and then get something welded to it. I put the collector box on. I usually stitch it in place or weld it out. And what that's going to do is now that I've got those two big nasty holes cut in those heads, now those things are going to, they're going to relax. They're going to move stuff like that. Well, I've tacked something in there to prevent further movement, which will minimize how much the inside of my doors flex compared to the tank. Now, if you went through there and you cut, 
your firebox hole, your stack, and then you cut all your doors out. That thing's going to just boing on you, and it's going to do whatever it wants because it lost all of its structure, if that makes sense. Um, the reason I started doing that, I should cover too, is because I literally had, I built a, a 500 gallon for Matt Growark, and I wanted to have split overlap doors, which is like my bingo build. So in other words, when the doors, where the doors are cut, there's nothing in between. Both doors will open, one door will open or the other. It just depends on how you build it. But there's no structure in the middle, like a, a split between those doors on his cooker. When we did that, that tank, not only did it twist, the whole tank twisted on us. It was crazy and a lot. It was not a little bit. It twisted on us and the middle, like was it was overrolled. So the middle squeezed in. And so if you ever look at that, cooker, if you see pictures of it, you'll see I built this sign that kind of resembled like a suspension bridge. That was that was a structural element to keep that cooker at bay so that it would match the doors. The doors just did their thing. They didn't spring, but that tank moved all over the place. And so that's why we have to be careful when we start doing that. So my advice, don't worry so much about bracing the doors before you cut them out. Do that as an after effect. Try to work through your build, like get everything around the doors. The doors are the very last thing that you cut. And uh, whenever you cut them, you might get a little bit of a spring. I've noticed after I started doing it this way, I usually wind up with about a 3 16th of an inch spring on one corner of a door. Typically, it'll be on the corner closest to the head. And it'll spring like the tank will contract and it'll look like the door sprung open is what it'll look like. And if you watch around on some of Danny's posts on here or mine from early on, I don't remember if I've ever even posted pictures of it, honestly, but we use a 10 ton, uh, port of power, which is a thing you can get from Harbor freight for, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks, 160, whatever it is. And it's a 10 ton press that like when you crank the jack handle, it pushes out like this, or it'll pull depending on the attachment you have on it. And we just stretch that head the way we need it to go. And then we put something in there like our cooking rack brace or something. And that'll actually hold that tank at the same radius as the door. Alternatively, you can use the chain hoist from Harbor Freight. They're pretty cheap, usually around a hundred bucks. You don't need a huge one. Um, just a one ton or a three quarter ton. It's like a ratcheting chain hoist is what it's called. And you can literally hook the door and you can pull it tighter that way. Or you can put it on the outside of the door and pull it open if you put a block underneath of it. And then you can put your gusset in. Not hard to fix. It's gonna, if you do the firebox and the collector and all the other cuts and get those welded up, then it's gonna minimize how much deceit and trickery you gotta use to get that door to match up. And then on top of all of that, there's this word we have in manufacturing called tolerance. And uh, we, it's something, it's just like a thing that we say, look, this is good enough. Like no one's really going to notice, but us, it bothers us. But at the same time, the customer's not like usually worried about whatever this is and it's not going to affect performance. That's the word tolerance in my language. And so what me, what that means in English is like, I always wondered, like the guys that are producing every single day, the guys with all the attention, for instance, Sonny Moberg, I called Sonny up one day and asked him, I said, Sonny, what do you, uh, what do you do on your doors? Like when, it, when do you chase this door and try to get it right? And Sonny said, three sixteenths of an inch. If I've got three sixteenths of an inch of play, that's the maximum. And at that point, it, it is a judgment call. If it's less than three sixteenths of an inch, we got nothing to talk about. Just move on down the road because this is an airflow game and we're not worried about like leaking a little bit of air, so to speak. So I hope that answered your question there. That's what these things are all about, Greg, is, is getting going to the deep end of the pool and uh, me bantering on about how I feel about this stuff. As many pits as we I've built and as long as I've been doing them, you know, and hate seeing people just get discouraged because they've got a door that leaks or something like that. Don't get discouraged and don't worry about it. Um, you can always, it's just metal. You can always come back and chase it. 
And, uh, you know, most likely the only guy that's going to ever say anything about it is somebody you have no idea who they are in the comments on some Facebook group. And he's just being a jerk anyway. So that's why we have Smoker Builder U is so you don't have to talk to those guys because these guys don't really care. They'll give you advice if you care, but it's they're never going to yell at you about your doors. That's how this works. So there you go, guys. Oh, wait, let me say one more thing about Greg's question there. Um, by the way, whenever I have to reinforce my doors or pull them back into submission, my favorite thing to use is just a piece of like quarter inch or three eighths or whatever round bar. And then I just pull the door where it needs to be. And then I'll just tack that on both ends. Um, guys like Mike Garza, he's here watching. He's done some fancy stuff with like uh, turnbuckles and stuff. Like you can get those at, they're like a left and a right hand thread that stick out. And then you can tighten that down and pull your door where you want it. And then you can just leave it in there and jam nut, or you can uh, put a different brace in there and cut your turnbuckle out. Both of those are great, great ways to do that. We should probably spring the poop out of something one day and see if we can fix it on camera. I've just never, I'm doing it my way. I never have anything spring, so um, I never have to fix it. So there you go. Hey, I want to thank you for listening to the Smoker Builder podcast. And real quick, while I got you, I'd like to invite you to join our private community over on SmokerBuilderU.com. That's SmokerBuilder, the letter U, dot com. On that website, it's a private community full of guys like us that are just totally ate up with building and cooking on smokers. So when you join over there, you're going to be set free from all the internet trolls and the Facebook group haters and all of that stuff that none of us like. You can post your build, you can post your cook, you can ask technical questions and get them answered, or you can just join in with the community and have a lot of fun. So also, if you have a special topic you would like us to cover on this podcast, make sure to bring it up while you're over there. Anyway, till next time, keep your smoke thin and blue, and I can't wait to see your success building and cooking on smokers.